All right, there we go. Everybody see the screen okay? Okay, so this is a view from the top of our, what we call our A-pond pad. These are the large reddening ponds, they're about as long as a football field and about four feet <laughs> wide. Um, you're looking over at the, the cemetery here and then down the hill to our covered tanks and then uh, 271 is behind those covered tanks, sort of get you oriented. <coughs> the goal of our whole operation is to grow enough algae to put into these large reddening ponds. And as I mentioned, they're about 65 to 70,000 gallons of water with algae in it that we put in there. So it takes a while for us to generate enough algae in order to feed these large ponds. And then we take the water, we remove most of the water, we process what's left, what we call the biomass, and then we run that through our uh, factory, our production. So I'm gonna sort of take you back to the beginning because where this all starts is in our lab. Um, but I'd like to just tell you why we're doing this. A lot of people say, why are you growing algae? It occurs in ponds and golf courses and <coughs> koi ponds, as somebody mentioned today. Uh, so, yeah, this one. Yep. Great. So the algae we grow produces a substance called astaxanthin. And astaxanthin is a very powerful, what's called antioxidant. And it, it's a molecule that will grab uh, singlet oxygen, which can do a lot of damage in human cells. And so the goal for our algae production is to put our astaxanthin eventually to sell it to somebody who's going to put it into gel caps and make a nutraceutical out of it. And there have been lots of different studies that have proven the health claims of astaxanthin, uh, everything from joint re reducing joint pain, uh, reducing skin damage from UV exposure, and there's even been some recent studies about um, reducing dementia in older people. So there's a lot of potential uh, benefits of taking astaxanthin, and most people don't get enough of it. Um, in nature, it's produced by algae, like the algae we grow, but it's also produced by algae in the oceans, and it shows up in a lot of different places in nature. Uh, this is a, a salmon fillet. The reason salmon meat is the color it is is because of astaxanthin. In fact, when, they, when uh, people grow salmon in aquaculture operations, they have to add astaxanthin to the feed or else the meat will be gray. And I'm sure if you went to the, the meat counter at, uh, at a uh, grocery store, you wouldn't want to buy a salmon filet that was gray. So they have to add the astaxanthin to it. It also is responsible for the color of shrimp and the, uh, the color of flamingo feathers. So astaxanthin is in a lot of different places in nature. We grow it because we want to sell it to people who are going to put it in these nutraceuticals for human use. Okay, it's an algae, and so a lot of people get confused about different types of algae. There's, you know, as simple as you get, there are two different types. There are macroalgae. Macroalgae is basically seaweeds, the large um, uh, plant-like organisms that you see growing on rocks at the seashore or on the bottom of the ocean. The algae we grow is called microalgae because it's a single cell. In fact, in that teaspoon of our algae, there's probably about five million cells that fit in a teaspoon. So it's very, very small. So we call it microalgae. The microalgae that we grow has a big, long Latin name. It's called Hematococcus pluvialis. We don't like to say that because it's a mouthful, so we just call it HP for short. So if you hear me referring to HP, that's our algae. And our algae has two very different, well actually it has lots of different stages that it can, that it can grow in. Um, most of the time, it's green and small and it swims around. It actually has two small appendages called flagella that it can beat back and forth and it can swim through the water. That's when it's uh, happy. If you give it enough nutrients, if you give it enough light, if you control the temperature and the pH of the water, then it will stay in this green, what we call happy state. And it will divide and make more of itself and it will grow. If you take away the nutrients, if you stop controlling the temperature, if you expose it to high levels of light, especially uh, UVB radiation, 
then it will get what we call stressed. And in response to being stressed, it's like a defense mechanism, the algae will go from these smaller swimming cells to these large, what we call cysts. It makes a thick wall around itself and it starts producing that astaxanthin to protect itself. So through most of our process, we want to keep the algae happy because we want to grow a lot of it. And then at the very end, the final stage of our process, we make the algae unhappy. We, we take it away what it needs to grow, we stress it out, and then it makes this astaxanthin that we eventually harvest when our process is done. <clears throat> okay, it all starts in, in our lab. And we start from a very small volume. This is a bottle that holds about 200 milliliters of culture. And we keep restarting these small bottles in our lab. We grow them on shelves in front of a fluorescent light. And we aerate it and we give it CO2 and we keep the room temperature regulated. We give it lots of nutrients, what it needs, and then as this small bottle <coughs> becomes denser, in other words, there are more cells in there than when it started, we take a small volume of that and we put it into a larger container. And then still a larger container, and then we, we end up in this uh, six gallon carboy. It's about 22 liters. <coughs> We've got racks and racks of those glass carboys. And up until recently, that's what we used to send outside to our big outdoor tanks. In order to keep these cultures as clean as possible, we have a very um, uh, highly controlled environment. We have HEPA filtered air. We have these hoods that are sterile. We can sterilize them with UV radiation. We wear gloves and lab coats, and we do everything we can to keep these cultures as clean as possible. The next step after that six gallon carboy is a 200 liter bag, so that's about 53 gallons. And we built these specialized racks for the bags. The bags are uh, polypropylene. We started making them ourselves, and then we found a manufacturer to custom make them for us. So we put one of those glass carboys into this 53 gallon bag, and then we grow it the same way we do the rest of the lab cultures. It has uh, fluorescent lights on both sides. We grow that up. And then that's the final stage of our lab culture. After this, the algae goes outside because we have to get even larger. <clears throat> All right, so these are those greenhouses that I talked about. This is the inside view. And these tanks are, the design of these tanks is called a raceway. So it's basically a long oval. It has two channels. Channels are divided by a center wall. And then the algae is moved around by these paddle wheels that are just driven by a motor on the outside of the tank. There's a cover over the tank, and that cover is uh, it has, it has a metal frame, and then it has polyfilm stretched over it. And <clears throat> if you saw those hoods that we use on the inside to keep everything clean, we also do our best to keep these large tanks clean, although it's much more difficult because they're sitting outside, they've got, they get rained on, they have wind and dust and dirt blowing around. But we do uh, clean these out, our crew cleans these out with um, pressure washers, and then we use a sanitizing agent that we spray on the inside before we put our algae culture in there. So there's, there's two different covered stages. We've got an 800 gallon tank and then a 5,000 gallon tank. And those are uh, started in pairs. So we have two 800 gallon tanks, two 5,000 gallon tanks. And then we use two 5,000 gallon tanks to start our reddening ponds. So this is where we start to stress the algae. So in, in those smaller cover tanks, we give the algae nutrients, we give it, uh, we control the pH, we control the temperature in there. We try to keep it as happy as possible so that it will continue to grow. But once we transfer those two 5,000 gallon tanks up into these large reddening ponds, we, do, we no longer add those nutrients, so we take the nutrients away. <clears throat> and the nutrients are um, nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, uh, chloride. A lot of the things you can see in uh, plant fertilizers are what we add to the, to the water to make our algae grow. But once we get to these reddening ponds, we no longer add those nutrients. Now we're getting a full a blast of light and UV radiation. We don't control the temperature in these large ponds. And what happens is they go from that green stage to that red uh, stressed out stage and they start producing astaxanthin. Okay, 
<laughs> when the tanks are open, we don't we can't really control what gets in them. Lots of other things do. Insects get in them. Sometimes birds, snakes, frogs. We do our best to keep the large stuff out, but there's lots of microorganisms that also like our algae. So this is a, a ciliate that eats our algae. And this organism over here is called a rotifer. And they are small animal-like creatures that swim around in our ponds once the covers are off. And uh, as you can see, this one is, has dozens of our algae cells inside. So it's been eating. This is an amoeba right up here. And then over here is a, a big flock, and the flock is just a bunch of algae cells stuck together. And you can see that a lot of the cells in that flock are dead. So a lot of our biological research right now is focused on remediation, how to deal with these sorts of things that also like to eat our algae. Um, so we're doing research on how to speed up the process so we'll get our algae through that open tank faster, and also specific remediations, what we can add, what conditions we can change so that these predators don't have as big an impact on our product. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems we've had recently is a fungus, and this is a parasitic fungus called a chytrid. And there are, there are chytrids that, um, if you may have heard, the, the amphibian populations in North America have been on the decline, uh, frogs and salamanders and newts. And that's because there are, there are chytrids that actually attack frogs and salamanders in their egg masses. This chytrid, right here stained in blue, specifically likes to attach to and then drain our algae cells. So you can actually see it's stuck on that algae right there, and it sends this little process inside the cell, and then it sucks it dry. So it's a nasty little fungus, and another large um, research project we have this winter is to try and figure out ways to stop or slow down this fungus. Okay, if we don't have problems with predators and parasitic fungus, uh, then we'll move on to harvest one of these tanks once the biomass gets high enough and once it has enough astaxanthin content. <clears throat> and the way we do that is we insert this thing, it's called a decant collar in the drain. Now, the, these tanks are 70,000 gallons. There's no way we could possibly run that much uh, volume through our indoor uh, production facility. So what we have to do is drain most of the water out. Luckily, when those cells get big and red, they, will, they tend to stick together into those flocks. And when you stop the paddle wheel, they'll sink to the bottom. So we shut the paddle wheels off, we let it sit for two, three hours, all that red biomass settles to the bottom of the tank. Then we stick the decant collar into the drain, and we open up the drain. And we let most of that 65, 70,000 gallons drain out of the tank. And what we're left with is about an inch of a little bit of water and a lot of biomass sitting on the bottom. And we, we have these big custom-made squeegees that we push it all down to the drain. We run it through a screen, a filter, and then we pump it through a fire hose, or many fire hoses connected, down to these big harvest towers. You may see out outside of our warehouse. <clears throat> and from there, it goes into our indoor processing facility. So we run it through a centrifuge, which removes most of the water. What we get out of the centrifuge is a, is a product we call cake. Uh, the algae is actually pretty close to cake batter. It's about 20% solids. And from there, we run it through a machine called a homogenizer. Um, the nice thing about our cells is that they're in these hard cysts, we call them. They stick together, they settle to the bottom, so that helps us. Unfortunately, we need to get the astaxanthin out of those hard little cysts. So we have to run it through a machine called a homogenizer that breaks open each of the cells and releases the astaxanthin. Once it's run through the homogenizer, then we have this uh, machine called a belt dryer. And we basically spread that cake batter-like substance that has lots of astaxanthin in it on this belt in a thin layer. It goes down the belt dryer, gets blasted with very hot air. And when it comes off the other end, it's about 3% uh, moisture. So it's very dry, it's flaky and powdery. And that's what we uh, put into bags and vacuum seal, and then eventually sell. So that's pretty much our process.
folks have any questions? Yeah. Talk about greenhouse and the pots. I mean, if you're concerned about uh, outside contaminants, would greenhousing the ponds increase your UV while reducing the outside contaminants? We're, yeah, we're actually looking into that. And, and part of the problem is a lot of the um, polyfill material have UV stabilizers in them. So they actually block a lot of the UV light. And, and that's one of the most important uh, stressors is that UV light. We found some that allow about 50% transmission of UV light. We're looking to see if we can find some that, are, that allow more of that UV through. Yep. Yes? Are those predators visible to the naked eye? No. How do y'all, I mean, how do you know when they're there? Every day we take uh, samples of all the tanks and we bring them into our lab and we do microscope checks. So we'll take about 50, mil, 50 milliliters of, this, of the um, culture from the tank, put it into a centrifuge tube, spin it really fast, which forces all of the material down into the bottom. And we take a dropper and we put it on a microscope side and we look around. Uh, so it, it requires a lot of um, attention. attention, exactly. Yes? Where do you pump the 75,000 gallons of stuff to? Mayor. <laughs> that goes to the city of Gilmer. Yeah, it goes down the drain. Sanitary sewer? Uh, yes. Storm that, sewer? Yeah, storm sewer. Storm sewer. Believe, yeah. It's not, not sanitary water. sewer. It's not, uh, it's not hazardous. Yeah. Right, we, we actually just recently sent a sample down to Analab in Kilgore to do an analysis for the industrial discharge. And we have those reports. Um, I mean, there's not, there's not much in there, because if there were uh, any of those nutrients, then the algae would return red. So we, we want it to be depleted of all the nutrients that we normally use in our uh, growth process. Yeah. And you know, it, it, that, it, that is a lot of water, and there are some algae facilities that recycle their, their process water. Part of our problem is, we have, this is uh, everything we do has to be food grade, because this is going to be for human consumption. Um, but there are certain there are certain companies that are working towards being able to recycle water and use for food grade. Right now, most of them are for um, biofuels that, that reuse their water. Yes, sir. Approximately, how many people do you employ here, and are you going to expand in the next year or two or something? If you we have we have about twenty right now, um, and our investors our investors are a group from uh, Belgium. And we have presented them with our most recent uh, production numbers, and we've asked them for an expansion here on the Gilmer site. And we're actually we're waiting to hear back from them. So eventually, right now we are not uh, we're not at commercial scale. This is a pilot project to sort of prove our technology. Eventually, so we have two of those reddening ponds, and then four of the 5,000 gallon tanks, and four of the 800 gallon tanks. A full-scale facility, we'd like to go to 28 of those large ponds. So to go from two of them that we have now to 28. Do we, do we have the do we have the land available here for them? Not to do the full 28. We've, we've asked for a doubling right now. So we have space at our current Gilmer site to do two more of the large ponds and, and eight more of the other growth tanks. Um, and if we got to that point, we could begin producing enough that we could actually sell it. Part of our problem is we have all, we have this material we've been generating as part of our proving of our technology, but most places want a whole lot more than we can produce um, in order to fulfill um, orders for either nutraceuticals or the other main um, so the other main market right now is aquaculture feed additives. So to put in the salmon feed so that the salmon will have that pink flesh. And though they require a lot more, they require many metric tons uh, just to just to fulfill an order. How many places make this today? Uh, there are, let's see, we make it. There's a company in Hawaii that makes it called Cyanotech. There's a company in the desert of Israel and in central China. And then there are a couple smaller facilities, and that, that's the outdoor growth. Um, there are there's a facility in Washington State that does it all indoors in fermentation tanks. They built a I think it was a $40 million factory. This Fuji Chemical Company of Japan invested in this factory in, in Moses Lake, Washington, in order to do it. And there's, uh, let's see, there's a small company in Iceland and one in New Zealand. So, not many. Why don't you all pick Gilmer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
that's a that's a good question. I wasn't here when that decision was made. I, I showed up in August of 2014. The two, uh, the CEO and the CFO of our company, lived in Ohio. They started a company called Independence Bioproducts, and they were trying to grow another green algae called chlorella, which doesn't produce astaxanthin, but it produces oils and proteins. So they were doing that at a, I think it was a coal-powered, a coal-fired power plant in Ohio. So you know, we need, we also need uh, carbon dioxide. That's another, you know, critical nutrient for plant production. So we actually pumped carbon dioxide into our tanks. They were taking the waste carbon dioxide from the power plant and using it to grow chlorella. But they were doing it in Ohio, and they had a very short growth season. So they um, came down to, I forget which town it was, it's about an hour south of here, another coal-fired plant. They started a project there, and their chief biologist at the time said, well, why are we doing chlorella? We should be doing hematococcus, which you know we could sell for a lot more money than the chlorella. So that's where they started making the switch from chlorella to hematococcus and the astaxanthin. And they started looking around this area for places to headquarter. So. Yeah. yeah. So you did say you didn't have enough room for 28 tanks if you had a, a maximum expansion. If that goes well, do you have some more land right here close that you maybe could look at, or would you have to build a plant some distance from here? We, the company has looked down in Longview <coughs> at, a, at the North Industrial Park. We, we don't have any, there's no uh, deal or anything. We're, we're basically just looking around right now. Uh, but again, it all depends on what the investors say. And they can come back and say, no, we want you to continue to you know, look into how to control these predators and this parasitic fungus and, and, and you know, have, all, have a better plan for dealing with these potential problems. Or they could say, you know what, you've, you've been hitting your numbers for the past three months. Let's double you, your production at the Gilmer site and see where you go from there. If you put in these other ponds, is it feasible to transport that, or do you have to duplicate everything you have out here where those ponds are? That, that is a very good question. We could um, we, we could decant what we have at the site and then bring, we could truck it in a tanker or some sort of liquid uh, carrier over to our plant here in Gilmer, because that's where all our big equipment is, the centrifuge, the homogenizer, the belt dryer. Um, I mean, that's we need that to finish our process. So it would be possible. And in fact, when we were talking, the initial conversations about Longview, that was part of part of the plan. It was okay. We'll have ponds down there. We'll we'll decamp. We'll get them. We'll get as much water out as we can, and then we'll bring it to Gilmer to process. Yeah. yeah. To answer that, some of those questions, Gilmer up the foundation is working hand in hand with Texas to make sure that if they have need for more real estate, I mean we're on top of that. I'm working on the adult foundation is and so. You know, if the need develops, then then the adult foundation is working with. To keep it going at all possible. Right, and that and that 28 a ponds, the, the 28 reddening ponds that I was mentioning, that was if other parts of our process didn't fall into place. There are other ways to increase the value of our product, like that the homogenizer. Like we could we could just harvest what we have in the pond, dry it, and sell it. But we would get more money for the product if we break the cells open before we sell it. And then there's also another piece of the of the process called extraction, which is actually removing the astaxanthin oil from all of the other uh, chemicals or all the other molecules that are mixed in and that would be an even uh, higher price that we would get for that product. So we're working on ways to add value so that we don't have to uh, have as big a footprint. Right, thank you.